So thank you for giving me a chance to present a different uh, approach to all the, uh, the opportunities that uh, COMP has offered the community. Um, these two talks that we just heard are just spectacular to see how we learn basic mechanisms from studying uh, these knockouts. But my, my approach is, is, is going to be is somewhat different, that how can we understand this, how it affects uh, uh, diseases affecting the skeleton. Uh, this is going to be much more from a clinical point of view than from a basic science point of view. So what I'm going to be talking about primarily is we had the opportunity to learn how to interact with comp lines when we were looking at homozygous knockouts. And I want to t relate that experience and then tell you how it's going to apply to this for the het heterozygous animals. And the rationale for doing this is that skeletal disease, um, although you don't die from it, you cost the country an awful lot of money. Somewhere between 5% of our total GNP is directed toward diseases affecting the skeleton. And it affects people, it, it is the highest disease category of all diseases in terms of those that are affected. Uh, you know, it hits you in the midlife, it never goes away. Orthopedic hospitals are proliferating everywhere and just driving the cost of medicine out, out, the, out the wall. So these degenerative diseases of the skeleton that we're primarily interested in, it turns out that approximately 60 or more percent of the effect is genetic. There are a number of clinical studies that show that these diseases affecting the knee, the, your, your joints, your bones, your, your spine, have a genetic cause for this. And being an ex-pediatrician, I think of this as a pediatric disease. These are genes that these children have inherited that we need to recognize to modify behavior and potentially prevent progression of disease so that they don't go on and have degeneration and have all these huge costs. So we wanted to see whether or not we could use COMP to try to identify uh, these, um, uh, some diseases that otherwise are not being picked up uh, by the current stream. So, um, and the reason why, and, and so in this screen that we did over the last four years, um, we looked at 220 lines agnostically and turned out that about 10 to 15 percent of these animals, just homozygous knockout animals, viable, uh, had significant abnormalities in their skeletal phenotyping. And so, um, and that plus GWAS data would predict that there's somewhere like 3,000 plus genes that can impact your skeletal health, either making you more resistant to having these things happen or to making you more susceptible to that. So why is it so complex? Why could it be so many genes? This is a huge issue that the skeletal biology field is going to have to confront. So when we look at the uh, uh, histology of bone and how it is organized, we have bone that's, uh, that is uh, resting or is being remodeled that is already there. These are basically trap cells, uh, the osteoclastic cells that are remodeling bone. They have their own set of issues. Then we have the osteogenic side of the, of the equation in which you have the, the cells that are AP positive, they're laying down a matrix and they also are mineralizing this matrix and that can be high or low. And then in between is you have the actual action where it makes a decision whether you're going to have cells that are going to be going down more the, uh, the osteoblastic route to promote formation or the remodeling moment. So this is ba balance between formation, it's all called remodeling. There are a huge number of genes involved in all this, this process. Now the osteocyte, it turns, it turns out, the osteocyte, which is the, the cell that is buried within the bone matrix, appears to be the brains of this whole outfit. It has these dendritic processes that, that communicate with progenitor cells on the surface, and on particularly perivascular cells, which are progenitors, as well as the osteogenic cells that are on the, uh, uh, on the uh, endocortical uh, surface of, of your bones. And this cell not only 
senses mechanical loading and therefore influences what the cells will do in response to mechanical loading or a fracture, but it also senses your environment. It senses hormones that will regulate calcium and phosphate. It secretes hormones that will, that will affect your metabolism, your overall metabolic activity. So this is very much a partner in, in uh, the whole scheme of uh, homeostasis. Um, and um, it, it, so it, and then on the other side, this, the other important part of this is the coupling, that is the, the talk that goes on between the osteoblast and the osteoclast, how do they stay coordinated? And there's a huge set of pathways now that we now recognize and diseases of these pathways, all of which could be targets of genes that we would need to, that we need to understand. So we initially, we established this, our program to start to screen and look for these possibilities by having uh, the production facility at JAX give us breeders and the animals were bred at JAX and then the bones were sent to us and we did the analysis. So all the, all the mouse stuff was done up at JAX with our, our collaborators who were there at the time. And what we learned was, number one, if we did micro-CT, so we really felt we had to do micro-CT and not a, a bone density because of the lack of specificity, which we'll get to in a minute. We were shocked to see that the variance in just bone, uh, bone volume, BVTV, a measurement of how, how dense the trabeculae are, how, how high the variance was in male mice relative to, to female mice, and that the saw that there is seasonal variation in this, did, we could not validate that. That did not seem to be the case at all. So because of this, we said we had to do at least eight males and eight females in order to get statistical power to make any statement. So these were control animals, uh, eight males, eight females, taken every month over the course of the study just so we get a very solid background of what, of what the uh, variants would be. And one of the things that we learned early on is that, it, looking at the data at the end of the time, is that if we plot changes just in body weight, so this is fractional increase or decrease in body weight, and this is a fractional increase or decrease in BVTV, trabecular density, that there really was a very poor correlation. There really was no relationship at all between a, a bone, a trabecular bone and b body weight. But if you looked at the cortical size, how thick the cortices are, and more importantly, even how large the bones are, there's a very strong relationship between body size and bone size. So this really explains why, BBT, why the DEXA really is telling you more about how much bone you have and not how, what the quality of the bone is. It really is not telling what we need, we re need to know. So that was important. So we screened these 220 lines and we started to look at them as groups. So this is a, the group of animals that had a low BVTV. And, I'm going to, and so these are the top 10 hits in which the ratio of their BVTV relative to control is, is highlighted here. So this is the, the, uh, the, the femur and this is the vertebra. These are some bone size and body size measurements. So the one that is most striking, it came up pretty early on, was IRF8. So I wanted to go use that as an example of how we drilled down to, to learn about that mouse more. So this just shows the, how severe the BBTV value is in the trabecular bone of the femur in the female and in the male and in the vertebra of the two. So both bones are greatly reduced in BBTV. Unfortunately, if you're looking at the IMPC site, there's bone was looked at, nothing was identified. This is the, bone, the BMC uh, content, which is probably the best measurement to look at for uh, a BVTV. We didn't, uh, there's, did, what didn't show as being abnormal. And this is the growth curve. We agree the animals were normal size. So we did our, 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 our micro CT, oh, my left, this, hmm. Um, so this is the, the data now expressed in a way that boneheads like to see this, where we just do t-tests between test and control. And you can see that now that the BBTV is low in the femur 
and in, in the female and the male. Um, and, and it's primarily due because there are fewer trabeculae rather than smaller trabeculae. Um, this is the same thing in the vertebra, low BVTV, low nu cell, uh, size, a uh, number of, uh, of uh, trabeculae, essentially normal in the, um, uh, in the size. Now we did our histomorphometry. So in these animals get two doses of a mineralization dye so we can look at the, the, the line, the mineralization lines histologically, and we can measure uh, how the mineral is incorporated. And the measurement shows that the bone forming activity actually is, uh, is pretty normal, not, not, a, not a big difference in the femur or it slightly increase in the female. And this is another example of the dimorphism that we see in sex dimorphism. So there is something there, uh, but not very impressive. We can't blame it on less bone being made. But if we look at the histology of this, from the cellular point of view, things become very clear. So the measurement of trap activity, there's much more trap on the surface of bone, and particularly trap on a surface of bone that's actually also being labeled, being a remodeling site. So there's lots of trap activity on the degradation side. There was surprisingly little increase in the bone forming activity. You'd expect that, the, 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 if they have all this removal of bone, that you'd have a lot of formation. And we were surprised we didn't see that in this one. And then, and the, and then here, these are the actual measuring the cells that are actually initiating the whole process. So there are a lot of sites that are trying to initiate these processes, but the bone is not going forward to actually fill it in. And this same pattern we saw in the vertebra also. High, high trap activity here, relatively unimpressive bone forming activity, but a lot of attempts to try to make it to make the bone. So that's all we, that's as far as we can go. But the literature helped us a lot on this one. This is a pretty well studied animal. So we know IRF8 is an inhibitor, is an inhibitory loop of NF kappa B. So without this being active, you have a lot of overexpression of NF kappa B that drives osteoclasts into becoming osteoclastic cells. So there's a lot of acti that will explain why all there's the, all this osteoclastic activity. Clinically, this presents primarily as an immune uh, immune deficiency disorder. Has no bone phenotype has been reported in omen even. Although there was a very interesting uh, uh, study showing that in mice, in the heterozygous IRB mice, they have loss of their tooth um, roots. So this, it's go they're going to lose their teeth. And so it's a, the dental people will be very interested in this because they're going to uh, have periodontal disease. So how do we explain this, 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 pro this problem of why the bone, the, the osteogenic side was not better? And so it turned out that there have been some targeted studies uh, of this, where if you knock out IRFR8 in a, the, in just in the, in the, uh, on the myeloid lineage, then you don't get low bone mass. You have a lot of osteoclastic activity, but you don't get low bone mass, th suggesting that in this case, the bone cells are responding. And if you overexpress NF, NF kappa B, in osteoblasts, which be, might be the case in this, you have a diminution of osteogenic differentiation. And with the di di diminution of osteogenic differentiation, that is, that is now, uh, has a negative impact on the hematopoietic system, which and particularly B cells, because of the, the role that, the, that bone plays in supporting hematopoiesis. So this is an example of how we identified a kale line that we would we really be one that you could drill down on much more and understand both the coupling mechanism between the two and how the, the osteoblast plays a role in immunocompetence, uh, animals that could be studied in much greater detail. Now on the other side, we, of high bone mass, we identified the top one, and this was called RIN3. Totally has not been, it's totally unsuspected at all. No one has studied this one before. This one, however, has a various phenotype in that the, the trabecular bone mass is very high in the femur, but it's 
perfectly normal in the vertebrae. So another example of dimorphism. Okay, this is site dimorphism because your spine and your limbs come from different lineages. So that may be the explanation. The IMPC had, uh, didn't find any skeletal findings to, uh, at all. They are, you are, are reporting a low uh, uh, growth rate, a uh, uh, weight gain. We didn't see that, but that's, the, uh, our mice didn't see, show that, so I don't quite know the explanation for that. So if we look at the, the CT data on this one, we can see that in the femur, BBTVE is high, uh, as, as uh, we said before, and it's also, they're more, uh, uh, more terbeculae, but the thickness is normal. If you look now at the bone forming activity, <laughs> there is, uh, uh, so this is the bone forming activity um, uh, in the femur, which is minimally increased at all, a little bit more in the female vertebra, if which didn't have a phenotype at the CT level. So relatively less bone forming activity than you might expect with all those big bones that they have. So the histology really helped on this one. So what we found in this one is that there is very low trap activity, very low osteoclastic activity in these animals. Bone forming activity is moderately increased in terms of the number of osteoblasts and active osteoblasts that are on the surface, and, but the remodeling activity is low. So what this means is that bone is not being resorbed. It is being made at a continuous rate. This is what we call bone modeling. This is what happens in a growing child. You're, you make bone at at more expense than, than remodeling the bone. It, it, so the balance is much more towards formation. So in this model here, the, the, this we have a high trabecular bone mass, primarily in the femur, this dimorphism we said about. It's due primarily to more trabeculae, and the increase is based primarily on low, low osteoclastic activity, but continued formatting activity. So this is extended modeling, if you will. So what is known about this gene? It's a strong GWAS candidate actually in Paget's disease. It, it, and the, the, the GWAS uh, uh, data, has there are a number of studies now showing that it actually delays the onset of symptoms of Paget's disease, which is a disease in which you have uh, osteoclasts that erode the bone, and then there's a very strong osteoblastic response to it. So in this case here, it prevents that from happening. Another GWAS that just came out showed that it's associated with increased bone mass in children. That's, that's interesting. And finally, there's another strong uh, uh, association with Alzheimer's and other forms of degenerative disease. Why is that important? Well, this would be an ideal candidate gene to study later on because number one, we have now something, a coupling gene that somehow prolongs formation. So if you, this would be the ideal drug for osteoporosis in which you could promote formation over osteoclastic uh, uh, activity. And then there's a whole new emerging literature of how the CNS influences the bone axis that could be studied too. So these are things that we learned from this, and it really influenced us how we would go forward with doing head comp. So head comp for us is that these are stronger effect genes. We're more likely to see adult phenotypes because of that. And we've enjoyed going to the embryonic uh, call meetings. Um, we'll try to be more vocal. I, we are often embarrassed to talk. So Steve, wherever you are, we'll try to show you that we're there, and we're gonna ask more questions. So so we'll, we'll let you know that we appreciate what you're doing for us. Um, and the thing that really has impressed us so far is how frequently there are craniofacial and limb developmental abnormalities. It, and that sort of hit us, well, of course, because those are two tissues that are essential for making it through embryogenesis. You don't need your mineralized skeleton to get through embryogenesis. That, you only need that when you hit the ground and you have to deal with gravity. 
So we may be really uh, uh, having to focus more on adult phenotypes affecting cartilage and the cranial facial than on, on bone per se. We hadn't thought that through. We're having to do our own breeding. And uh, wow. So we're both production and, and, and phenotyping, and this is uh, wow. So we're still, we're, we're hopefully soon we'll get our first animals uh, that will be start to do this. But because of the phenotypes, we think we're going to have to modify our phenotyping to make it more sensitive to bones as it relates to cartilage and shape. So the CT, not only is it good for looking at the internal structure of cortices and bone, but it also is good for looking at shape. So we can, we can look at the shape of the bone and see the angles and shapes of the various parts that bear weight. Why is this important? Well, the adults have shown us that, that you can use the, the, a DEXA scan and use that as a phenotyping tool for the onset of degenerative joint disease. So just changes in shape alone, which probably reflected either abnormalities in how the cartilage laid out the limbs initially or how weight is being distributed is one thing that we need to do. So we, there are, you, we can look at these surface renderings called STL files and do image analysis on them to measure in 3D the various stru structures that are here that are bearing weight, how are they changing in their bearing of weight. Similarly, we can look at the, the bone from top to bottom trend, uh, through all the image stacks and look at the relationships of various uh, structures as, uh, uh, throughout the whole, stru uh, whole structure of the bone. So this, we're fortunate we have a very strong image analysis uh, co colleague that's going to help us try to uh, deal, deal with those issues. Um. So, but the next thing is that we're going to have to deal with some histology. So I just want to show you, so we've been trying to now to use our histology to try to pull more information out of, these, uh, out of these joints. So the field usually looks at um, uh, degenerative joint disease after the disease has happened, where it's already been destroyed. We need to find a way of looking at stress that says you're going to be developing this kind of thing. And we hope that our histology is going to help. So I want to give you a couple examples of this. So this is our frozen sections in which it's held on, onto the slide with a piece of tape and allows us to do repetitive imaging of the same sections, not just with antibodies, but with other staining mechanisms. So this is a toluidine blue stain. This is a saffronone stain that's used primarily in cartilage biology. You can look at the saffronose stain under fluorescence. It has a very nice fluorescent image on which you now we can map various things to see what's going on. So this is the mineral, and this is the mineral overlaid onto that fluorescent background. This is the staining for the two mineralization dyes, green and red, that shows the trabeculae labeling. The growth plate in this 12-month week-old animal is still showing some labeling activity, but very, very little labeling activity on the cartilage or on the enthesis. I'm sorry, I should just give you a little more anatomy here. So we're very interested in the articular cartilage here of the knee. So this is, your, this is the, the condyle of your knee, and this is the condyle of the, 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 the tibial plate that it rides on. This is a, a ligament that's attending, uh, uh, attaching. This is the enthesis. That's another cartilage structure there. All of those are, can be affected. So we can look at those and we can say they are not mineralizing. They're qui quiescent. This is a normal animal. So now, uh, this, and this is trap. Uh, there's still a little trap activity, uh, the osteoclast at the growth plate. But other than that, it's a very quiescent uh, a, a normal animal. And this is alkaline phosphatase, which lights up all the osteoblastic cells on the bone surface, as well as the hypertrophic cells that are in the cartilage that have the capacity to mineralize if, they, if there's disease. So now to just show you quickly that this is an animal, a 16-week-old animal, otherwise normal animal, that we're still allowed to do this. We let him hang, hang him by his tail for 
three weeks, so he's running around on his front legs, his left leg, his hind legs are unweighted, so the, the, the loading of it has been totally changed. And when you do that, this is the mineral, now you start to see that they're getting mineralization lines here, and this is with, with the, the background shot of mineralization lines here around the enthesis. We're getting mineralization lines are, are, around on his articular cartilage. What this is saying is that this cartilage is now responding. It's starting to remineralize its bone. That will presage the onset of cartilage disease. So we're hoping that we can use this to um, uh, uh, look for early evidence of stress both by shape and this. And then finally, we can do this, at, at look at a growth plate. So this is the, the uh, Safranova, three-week-old animal. Uh, this is the mineral. This is now the labeling. You see how strong the labeling is in a rapidly growing mice. We can use that to look at the mineralization of the growth plate. But, nice, but the nice thing, we can also do EDU staining, so we can look at the proliferation index of this. So these are all things that we would like to try to implement um, in terms of going with this forward. So finally, I'd just like to try to get a conversation going about how interacting with comp we, we, could, we could benefit so much if we coordinated things in a different way. So here is how we did it initially. The mice were bred at Jack's, the, the parts were sent to us, and we did the analysis. The new version, we, we get the breeders, we grow them at, at Yukon, and then we characterize them. The advantage of that is that if we hit on an animal we like, we'll keep it alive. And we can drill down on it and get more information on it. That's, that's the big plus. I would like to propose a different way, because <laughs> this, this breeding is so expensive. I would, I would like to propose some kind of a model where our grant would pay for somebody at the production site who would harvest tissues for us as they're coming through with the production site. Let us screen them. Send the bones. The beauty about bones, you can just send them to us. And we'll screen them. And then we'll say, oh, this looks interesting. Do another round of breeding specifically for what we need. Mineralization labels, EDU, um, even harvesting the bones and sending them so where we can do the, the marrow cultures, because if you send us the bones on ice, we can do the marrow cultures. We can do it all that way. So it would be a far more efficient way of doing it. And multiple sites could do it. But the other what be, a beauty is this, is that there's, if we're going to knock off 3,000 genes, we aren't going to do all that. We're going to have to have multiple sites of doing this. And so, and given the fact that the biome is going to be different in every place, I mean, having a common production site where we send them out would be very helpful. And, but then have a common deposit site for the data that's bone-centric, that would be ideal. So that, I wish we could talk more about that kind of design. And likewise, when we discussed about the aging project, all these incredibly important bones that there, you know, <laughs> we can do <laughs> You know, we figure out a way that we can do it to make it more, what you have more valuable, and then it would be, it would be useful information for us also. So finally, in comp, that we will do the homozygous uh, animal, the, the, uh, the um, het <laughs> uh, uh, this should be heterozygous. I don't know why I said homozygous. Anyway, so we're going to be heterozygous. So we're going to be using micro CT and also body composition as our primary screen. Do we go further? We'll do our fluorescent imaging of the skeleton to look at the, at the histological level. We plan to do primary cell cultures of osteoblasts and osteoclasts to try to get at this issue. Is it autonomous or not? We will be having monthly meetings with a panel of bone experts that we will present our information to them to help, them help us interpret this, but primarily to say, who do you know that would like to study this animal further? We want to get the bone community invested in wanting to take these initial findings. I was talking to my colleague, how many people, in, in, at least in our world, knock out a gene, don't see what they wanted to see, and 
spend their life hoping to find something that they can do something this with. Well, isn't it so much better to give them something that we know has a phenotype right off and go from there? I mean, it just makes so much more sense. So these monthly meetings are going to be very helpful. And as I mentioned in the discussion, we've made an arrangement with the, G the journal G Bone to have a new s electronic site where we will give an overview of how we do comp, and then case reports will be made about interesting animals that we've taken so far so that someone could pick them up and take them further, and we could track how that happened. And the last thing that Peter May, who's not here t with me today, uh, came up with that is turning out to be very interesting is we started a, a course, an honors course, over at the Stores campus, which is about 40 miles from us, primarily for pre-med, pre-den, and pre-graduate students on heritable diseases of the skeleton. And we're using comp as the tool to teach them all this. And the goal is for them to write, help us write one of these, these uh, short uh, uh, reports that would eventually become a, 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 a short report that would go into this journal. So we you know, get them young, get them for life. That's what we need to try to do. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, David, beautiful, beautiful talk. Um, we just finished a study that I think would segue perfectly with what you're doing with COMP. So we, we did micro CT scanning of about 500, 600 animals, 60 strains of B by D, where B yeah. is the same B that COMP uses. Well, not quite the same. Right. Uh, and in that study, we also computed what we called a bone ignorome, a set of 2,000 genes that have absolutely no literature right. associated with bone, yes. but which have highly specific expression in bone and are great candidates. Yes. Uh, we came up with about 16 quantitative trait loci. We, you know, the typical quandary of the kind of forward genetics we do rather than the reverse genetics is there's really no highly efficient way to bring the worlds together, but your methods bridged with yes. the data sets yes. we have. Right. And I definitely will take you up on your suggestion. So if you need a breeding center to send you, we have a, about 150 strains of mice. They're all from B by D. They're all uh, replicable. And they're all at Jackson Laboratory also. So it'd be fun well, to I mean, bring these worlds together instead of having them do parallel play for the next 20 right. years. I, mean, I think that the CT scanning is not as overwhelming as it would appear to be. We actually convinced the institution to buy us a second one. And if we do it at a relatively low resolution, we can get the information we need very fast. So it's a, it's a very, it's a grease pipeline. It goes fast. And there's just so much information in the CT scans. I mean, the, certainly looking at x-rays and trying to pull information out of it is a laudable task. But the problem is the information is so limited that to me, we should invest in, these things should be done by CT and then really have great information to go with for. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yes, sure, please, I'm sorry. Are there any bones in particular that you're interested in at either E14, I mean E15.5 or E18.5 or are all bones equal at that stage? Um, we, ha we haven't encountered that yet to, to make that decision. Uh, Peter May, my co colleague on this, is a developmental biologist, and that is going to be his role. So we, because we will be getting some uh, 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 sublethal animals, I'm sure, in some of the lines coming through, I think we will look at them. But we really haven't thought hard yet about other than just describing them uh, uh, with, uh, with some size measurements. But, and we could, and definitely we would do the histology on them, too, to try to figure that out, too. But, we haven't, I mean, uh, the great talk that you gave, Jason, on you know, an organized way to structure your thinking about why it's failing at, failing at a certain place. We, we haven't, that's, uh, we want to be there someday, but we're a long ways from that. So, David. So, so David, great talk. Um, I don't, I mean, personally, I haven't obviously spoken to anybody yet, but I don't see any red flags in your proposal that you want to go. So I think we should talk about it. But just to clarify, so the 200 knockout lines that you were initially started telling us about, you didn't choose those That's based right. on data from IMP. You just took them. As a it was what was on the shelf coming off from the Jack site. Got it. 
Okay, so you know, when I'm thinking about what you're doing and what the embryo folks are doing, they're using IMPC data to select which ones they want to proceed in their lab. You have a more agnostic approach. You just select without any information, which is fine. Um, I guess what I'm curious is, is there any data that's being produced by IMPC that is of value in your project in order to, you know, think about how to right. better select because I can see what you're proposing and I certainly welcome you know your suggestion you pay somebody or that to the but you know I can see the cost going to be quite a, a barrier right for this well it certainly it's not it's not as expensive as re rebreeding all these guys bringing them in you know going through you know our animal care to get them into the house and so forth is very expensive um, I think that we are, now that we're doing these hats, we are doing some selection because of the expense of bringing them in, bringing them in. We want to have the majority of them to be a positive hit. If we were taking them from production, I mean, what I heard, the knife through the heart, you cut off the, the, the legs and the spine and you throw it in the trash. My gosh, that's my life right there. So <laughs> I, I, we can screen those. <laughs> so, but for the ones that we're breeding or bringing in, we are trying to select, make choices there. It's not agnostic, the, but the homozygous one was agnostic, and I would prefer to do all of them because we're totally surprised in all of these. I mean, there, there's just so many we never expected. So there's a couple of things. Um, so for the vi the sub Subviable and lethal lines, be, we keep, if you're interested in the hats from the subviable and lethal lines, they end up being on the shelf for quite a while longer, and we end up with a lot of extra heterozygotes. So I don't see that it would really cost much to take a, out a bone or two and send them off to you. Right. Right, if you wanted them fixed in some way or whatever. No, you and, just. It's actually a very detailed production, so we talked about this. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, right. We'll do the dissection. Yep. You just yeah, chop, yeah, yeah. chop, you know, like you're doing a chicken, and then it's just fine. Well, no, I'm just, I'm, like, I'm trying to figure out if, there, if it's possible, yeah. Yes, right? it is. That's, I, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Anything because we could do to promote that. We do have that. lots of extra hats. Right. For the I mean, the biggest issue is going to be this v problem we have with variants, that picking two yeah. it could be, we could get totally fooled. So yeah. that, that's well, the... Well, yeah, I mean, we have to understand from you what number right. you would need. Because if nothing else, at the end of the pipeline, the adult pipeline, we don't use the legs for most of these well, things. The well, that's no, what I'm I asking. If he doesn't even want to pre-select I would say we would just screen him. Yes, don't want them right. Because yeah. this is yeah. so, I mean, yeah, it's certainly more than doing a DEXA, but it is... The information is so good. Yeah. Okay. That so for the boneheads. So, they, so maybe they, our takeaway is uh, the comp group will meet, we'll cost it out, and we'll let you know what yeah. it would be, and then you can make the decision yeah. as whether okay. it's worth it. Yeah. I will, we'll, we'll, yeah. Yep. 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 I agree. Good. Thank you so much. This has been very helpful. Laurel, will, will you be the contact on that, or, yeah, you know, who, sorry, who wants to, uh, I can coordinate. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> what I mean, to facilitate the follow-up discussions, and then what I would like is, uh, then. As long as it doesn't involve a working group. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there may be a couple of phone calls involved, but, you, you know, you. Okay, and uh, yeah, just uh, send me an FYI when that settles down, and I will map that to the uh, action items uh, being taken post meeting. Right, and I, I so. want your contact information because I don't remember names well. So yeah, yeah. So okay, great. Thanks.